Well, hello again. Uh, we're here for an, uh, one of our updates. Uh, here with Paul Sams from Dutton Gregory. So, welcome, Paul. Nice to see you. Good morning, sir. How are you? All right, very well, thank you. Do you want to give us a bit of your background? What is it you specialise in? Um, well, I seem to specialise in sitting at home at the moment, <laughs> um, in front of the computer, um, dealing with video calls. But my background is I'm a property lawyer. I'm head of property at Dutton Gregory Sisters. So I predominantly deal with residential property, residential development, leasehold enfranchisement work. So that's extending leases or buying the free old blocks of flats where the leaseholders want to do that. And one of my niche areas is equity release. So releasing monies from properties for over 55s, which in itself is a specialist area. I also have the remit for overseeing all of the property work in the firm. So um, I fill lots of forms out and do lots of compliance as well. So you don't really do very much then? No, no, not at all, no. Um, my wife will tell you that I don't do very much and that's probably true around the house. Yeah, uh, interesting, let's just follow on from the enfranchisement uh, there. Um, a lot of people don't understand that they do have the possibility of changing their lease. They think they're just stuck into it. So if I'm a um, owner of a lease, or if I've got a leasehold property, what could I do with it? Um, in theory, you could do anything that's legal within it if you have the consent of the landlord and the landlord agrees. So, for example, if you wanted to turn it into, I don't know, a shop, mm. you could ask your landlord, I know it's residential, Mr. Landlord, could I turn it into a shop? And the landlord's probably going to say no, but in theory, if you had your consent, you, you could. Mm. Um, most enfranchisement issues stem from the fact that residential leases are a depreciating asset. And by that, there's two fundamental, well, there are three fundamental ways you can own the property in England. There is freehold, leasehold, and common hold. And um, common hold, I always tell the story, was something that Tony Blair and his guys came up with as an alternative to leasehold and freehold. And some of my peers nationally would say that common hold is the solution to all problems. But if I told you them, there are more books written about common hold than common hold units in the UK, yeah. you will probably get the feeling that it's not the most popular. And of course, mortgage lenders won't really lend on it, so that's an issue. But with freehold, you own the property for an indefinite period. It's yours, you've got it from your dot to when you sell it. With leasehold, you have a finite term. So that's either 99 years, 125, 155, 999, but there is a time limit on it. And franchisement lawyers, we, and probably I would say more surveyors and mortgage lenders, worry when there's less than 80 years left on the lease. When there's less than 80 years term left on the lease, then this magical figure called marriage values, and it's not something that Donald Trump or Rod Stewart would talk about, or perhaps they should. It's the increase in value to the freeholder of granting a lease extension. And Enfranchisement generally in a nutshell is that we try and get people to extend their lease before there's less than 80 years on it mm. to ensure that they can then sell their property for what its market value is. When it's got a shorter lease, it's not as desirable to buyers and certainly not as desirable to mortgage lenders. So our job is to try and get the best deal we can for our leasehold owners when it comes to getting a lease extension. The thing to bear in mind is that, as I said, you can speak to your landlord about anything, but when it comes to a lease extension, you've got a statutory option, depending on what criteria you meet, so you can actually force your landlord to give you a lease extension. Okay. Um, yeah, because uh, one of the big mistakes that people, we find that a lot of landlords make, especially when they're buying leasehold, is they don't read the lease. And we say to him, it's just critical that you have a, a conveyancing person who understands rental and understands leasehold, because you could end up with a property you just can't let out. Um, one of my favourite stories, and I've got lots of anecdotal stories, because I used to do this before I had hair, um, although that might be the kids that did this. In fact, literally, they did it at the weekend. So um, I'm looking like a fat Duncan Goodhue, for those that remember him. Um, is I was thinking about recruiting this list of ones many years ago and I thought I'll just ask his old boss who's a sort of mate of mine in the law what he's about and he said well Paul he's a nice guy I went oh, well, hang on you're saying he's a nice guy you're not telling me he's a brilliant lawyer straight away what's the issue he said well on his first day he walked into my office and said what are you doing John and John said I'm reading a lease and this book went what every page um, and I think that's where people go wrong mm. uh, 
leaseholds, because I act for a lot of developers, and I've done some leases over time that one of my colleagues, Rachel's, uh, is always telling me I will go straight to hell for drafting them. Um, the favourite one is escalating ground rents. Yep. Because I've sold properties before, although this wasn't the intention. Honestly, it wasn't the intention. But I sold four out of five in a block with new leases, and it was the fifth one that was a smaller firm that was acting for the buyers. All the others had had national firms acting, and they hadn't spotted it. And the lease said that the ground rent doubled every five years, or went up by RPI, whichever was the greater. Yeah. Well, it started at £100. Well, by the time it gets to the end of the lease, it was about £844 million. Yeah, right, yeah. Which is a bit of a concern. Well, my client called me when I pointed out on the fifth lease. Can I sell this? I went, yes. And said, congratulations, Rob. I said, your grandchildren are going to be multi-millionaires. Yes, yeah. Um, that, that's, a, that's a prime example. There are lots of clauses within leases that, again, I've seen and sometimes I may have drafted, shall we say, um, which make provision for my favourite. Um, obviously, I'd never do this, but my favourite to see is that it will say that the managing agents or freeholder for the block can charge 10% of any cost of any works. Now, that seems fine as a monitoring fee. It's not bad. A lot of managing agents charge that anyway in relation to their fees. But if there were 10 flats in a block and the roof needed repairing, say it was £10,000 worth of repairs, you would think, oh, the managing agent only gets £1,000 split across all 10 flats. Well, the way the lease is worded, and again, I may have worded these a few times in the past, that it's that 10% is per flat. So yeah. if it's £10,000 worth of repairs, the managing agent, more likely the freeholder, is going to make £10,000 worth of fees. And there's nothing illegal about that because they can justify it by saying it's in the lease. Mm. And if it's in the lease and the parties have had solicitors, then it's considered what's called a commercial bargain and they're tied by it, no matter how morally dubious it is. And, um, I mean, just a basic uh, clause, of course, is whether or not you're even allowed to, to let a property or technically sublet a property. So... Yes. Um, when it comes to letting, I get people saying, well, I don't want my landlord to know that who I've got there. And I say, well, that's the point. From a landlord, from a tenant's point of view, if you're the leaseholder, you want to be able to rent it out to whoever you want with restrictions. Mm. From a landlord's point of view, they're saying, well, hang on, we want to know who you're renting your flat out to. The head landlord you're talking about. Yes. Yeah. So the guys that own the block, yeah. they want to know who it's being rented out to for many reasons, security, insurance, yeah. for example, your build, building's insurance would be vitiated and invalidated if, for example, you were renting it out to a serial arsonist yeah. because the insurance company wouldn't be keen on having them live there. Mm. Same if you were renting it out to a serial fraudster, they would be worried that there's some sort of fraud going on and that could vitiate the insurance. Mm. So that, that's why that clause is there. Of course, it's really there because the freeholder can make money from it. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you mentioned something about managing agents, et cetera, et cetera. So explain how, if you've got a, a typically it'll be a converted house into three or four flats and uh, they want to take over the management of the property. How would they set about that? Um, you've got, well, this is a, this is sort of a series of books. Um, <laughs> and I, I'm writing another book at the minute, but this isn't, this isn't the topic, but you've got a couple of options. Um, well, First of all, they can just do it themselves if the managing agent allows without getting anything formal in place. They've got the option to form what's called the right to manage company. So they wouldn't buy the freehold, but they'd group together, form what's called an RTM mm. to take over the day-to-day -day running of the building. Mm. The landlord would generally still collect the crown rent as freeholder and arrange the insurance because it's their asset, but they would get everyone else to do everything else that was there without a question. So that would be fine from their point of view. They could set it all up so that they were running it themselves in sort of a cooperative, so to speak. And the other option they've got, which will actually cost them more, but would give them more control, is they could opt to buy the freehold and serve a statutory notice on the freeholder to say, we would like to buy the freehold, sell it to us. And even if the freeholder said, look, I want to do this, they still have to serve the statutory notices to make sure that they want that they could sell the freehold to whoever. So the freeholder might decide they don't want to sell it to the tenants, they want to sell it to Joe Blogg's commercial 
landlord down the road, but Joe Bloggs would want to see that the Section 5 notices, as they're called, are served on the tenants in the leaseholders correctly, yeah. because bizarrely, even though it's residential property transaction, if you don't serve what are called Section 5 notices, then it's a criminal offence. Mm. Yeah, and um, something else that comes up sometimes is um, a freehold property, someone wants to split it into two or three, say, um, how do they go about splitting the title? Um, there's, well, again, being a lawyer, I can't just give you a straight answer, and it's not because I charge by the minute, because I don't, although I could. Um, if it was, say, a house that you gave us a scenario where you've got three or four flats in it, the simplest way to do that would be to grant leases to all of the buyers that were purchasing, so they're all on the same terms, and that way you have the building itself um, as a wrapper around the actual leases. Alternatively, if it was, say, a piece of land that you were building houses upon, you could split the title by doing transfers of part from developer A to each of the buyers. And the way I liken that is that if you buy a residential house, like the house I'm in here, it's detached, you would imagine it's a type of cut cake, it's a single cake. Yeah. If you were buying something off plan from a developer, Barrett, Bovis, Persimmon, all the ones beginning with B, all of the smaller ones across the country, imagine it's one big chocolate cake yeah. and you're taking a slice away at a time. Um, what people don't often get themselves is, for example, I've got a fairly large garden. That if I wasn't in my gardens in the National Park, my house is in Test Valley, but my garden falls in the New Forest National Park. So I'm unlikely to build in it, mainly because my neighbours would object and I think my kids would object as well. But if I could, I could transfer that land from my wife and I to ourselves. But you can't transfer land to yourselves and grant yourselves rights. So I would have to transfer it from, say, my wife and I to her or to a third party company to grant rights against the land to rights of access. And that's where I often find people get confused. I've got some clients at the minute who want to sell their house but keep the paddock at the back of their house because they want to keep their horses in the local area and moving like 500 yards down the road. And when I told them you can't actually transfer that land to yourself because you won't get any rights, it becomes very confusing for them. So I said, well, if you could grant yourself rights, I said, if you throw yourself down the stairs, break a leg and sue yourself and claim on your insurance. Mm. Yeah. That's the ultimate, a bit, bit of a risk, a bit of a pain, but you know, for a few million, I'd probably do it. Yeah, but this is um, building on the ground. What yeah. if you were to split it that way? So in other words, you've got a tall enough house that you could uh, sell the top floor, say, split off um, the top floor. If you were going to do that, you would have to do it on a leasehold basis. You could set up a common hold, but I don't really want to have to get the 257 books and compare them to the sort of 46 common hold units that are across the country. Mm. Um, it would be on a leasehold basis because that way you would make sure that the lease had rights granted. So, for example, if the sale was going to construct a flat in my loft at my house, they would need a right way up the staircase and along the corridors to get up there. And they'd also need to know that I was going to ensure the building and cover them, as well as giving them rights to make sure they could get gas, electricity, water, and what have you there. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And in terms of um, leasehold, has, has the recent pandemic made much difference to you? Um, we've seen an increase in people making inquiries about dealing with enfranchisement matters because they've been at home. And they thought, you know, I should really think about extending my lease. Yeah. And that seems to stem from the fact that I've seen a flood since the lockdown measures have been eased slightly of people who live in major metropolises, so the likes of London, deciding they want to have a rush to, someone said to me yesterday, Mr Green. They want to be outside, they want to garden. And I had someone the other day, we were instructed on sale, went through in a week from start to exchange, including the bank holiday. Um, I can't tell you all the credit, the buyer's sister was very good and worked over the weekend, as did I, as did my client, his client, and the agent. But his client was selling a multi-million pound flat in London, in fact, they'd already completed on it. And they, rather than having their three bedroom sort of penthouse apartment in Chelsea, they wanted to have a garden. So they bought something out in Wiltshire with a good few acres and a bit of river in it. Mm. 
And any other little stories that have come out recently in, in property that uh, you're allowed to tell us? Um, well, it, it's been interesting to see how people have reacted um, throughout the period. A lot of firms of solicitors haven't done themselves any favours by, they seem to have interpreted the regulations that the government brought out to say people couldn't move. At no point were people banned during any period of time from moving house. Mm. That was always permitted provided social distancing measures were in place. The sort of issues being that people have interpreted the rules their own way without necessarily thinking what was best for their clients. And I've taken the view that I wanted to act in the best interest of my clients. And if all parties were willing to do something, that's what we should try and facilitate. We're not encouraging them to break the law. It's been interesting the number of estate agents who furloughed staff who then when you said to them, well, look, so-and-so can't move because they don't have removals, but they've made suggestions that people could do the removals for them because yeah. they have a van. Yeah. And I suspect quite a few agents have been doing removal work right. um, during the period. Yeah. Um, I don't have any proof of that, but I'm pretty sure that's what was happening. Yeah. The, um, the, the, oddly, the, the, was the biggest problem we've had as lawyers dealing with conveyancing matters during the lockdown period was getting mortgage lenders to give us redemption figures they didn't seem to want to have loans repaid because they'd taken everyone that was usually handling redemption figures and put them on the mortgage holiday helpline mm. and so to get something that would take generally a day it was taking a couple of weeks and you sort of had to beg them they're going to want to repay the mortgage which i understand yeah quite. yeah but um it's it, it's been traumatic for clients it's been traumatic for the lawyers because we've had to change our way of working. I was always one for, I'll go in the office and work, I'll go in the office and work. I tidy up a little bit of things at the weekend, but I love working from home. It's, it's far more efficient for me. I don't, I can get up and work quicker. I don't have to commute, spend some time with my family. Um, I'm slightly blessed and cursed in the fact that my wife and I both work in the same department. And now in the office, we, we never see each other. We're very uh, far apart. But at home, I'm in the kitchen office and she's in the study. Mm. And we see each other far too much, I think, for her liking. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about misunderstanding. Well, I was having a conversation with one of your colleagues, Rob Bowell. We all know Rob. Uh, and again, um, you know, we're both at great pains to stress to, to landlords that the law hasn't changed that much. I mean, people are sort of saying, oh, well, I can't evict anybody. You can still go through the process. You can still write the letters. You can still raise the notices. You just can't go to court at the moment, but very soon, hopefully you will do. So, you know, life does continue. It does. Um, one of the interesting anecdotes, I suppose, is the number of people that contacted me during the lockdown period going, where are their title deeds? And I said, well, they're at the land registry. And they say, why haven't they been registered? And I said, well, the land have a lot, have a, a backlog. I said, but why can't they do my thing now? They can't be busy. And I was, well, the land is essentially shut to all essential services until yesterday. Yeah. And they reckon they have 45,000 applications to process. But I had some matters that I'd submitted in um, March for what are called first registrations, transfers of part, lease extensions. And I said, can they be expedited? And they'll only expedite if I give them a letter written in blood saying that the property is going to be sold. Yeah. Um, not, notwithstanding that I've got trillion pound mortgage lenders saying, why hasn't it been registered in a day? I was like, the landlords have got backlog, I'm very sorry. Yeah. The letter I had in March told me they were working through their backlog from May 2019. Oh. So I, I'm expecting applications that I've made for transfers apart for the past couple of months to not get registered till January next year. Mm. Yeah, it's all good fun, isn't it? So, well, at any rate, well, well look, Paul, it's been, uh, been fascinating talking to you. So, and I'm sure we will talk again in the future. So, many thanks for your time. Thank you very much, sir.